As I've mentioned to you, our session today is on genetics part two. So we are gonna get straight to genetics part two so that we can see what we are covering in today's session. Now, as I've mentioned from our very first tutor session, your exam guideline is your second Bible. This will tell you exactly what you need to study for each respective topic in life sciences. Last time we completed our monohybrid crosses. We looked at some examples. In today's session, we're going to tackle blood groups. We're going to look at a dihybrid cross. We're going to look at pedigree diagrams, and then we're just going to look at what is required from us in mutations. Now, once again, if you look in your exam guidelines, and this is just a snippet from your exam guideline, you will see that blood groups, that is those three bullets, that is what you must know, how the different blood groups result in multiple alleles, what the alleles are, and what the different combinations of that is. But we'll go through each section, section by section, and we'll take our time with this, and please ask questions if you need to. Also, I've given you the key concepts that we need to determine. And in our last, in our previous session, let me just get my pointer ready. In our previous session, we did monohybrid crosses, we did sex determination, and we did sex linked inheritance. Right, let's start off with blood groups. Now, what are blood groups? Now, blood groups is one of those characteristics that are also inherited meaning we get it from our mother and our father. And if we look at blood groups, this is a very good example of, so the inheritance of blood groups is an example of multiple alleles, meaning it is not one allele. Here we have multiple alleles, right? And the alleles that we are talking about in blood groups, there are three alleles. And please note the way in which we write these alleles. It's a capital I with an A or a capital I with a B or a small I. So there are three alleles that indicate your blood groups, but you as a person can only inherit two of these alleles, meaning one allele comes from your father and the other allele from your mother. So the different combinations of these result in four blood groups. Now, one year in the exam, they ask learners to explain how it's possible that different blood groups can be formed from your alleles. So you would write blood groups have multiple alleles. That's one mark. There are three alleles indicating blood groups, IA, IB, and I. Different combinations of these alleles result in four blood groups. Now, we like to call the blood groups the one, two, three, four rule. If you know this rule of blood groups, you won't make a mistake. What does the one stand for? One. An individual has one blood group, or you have blood group is determined by one gene. What does the two stand for? An individual has two alleles for their blood group, meaning one allele from the mother, maternal, one allele from the father, paternal. There are three different alleles controlling blood groups. And what are the three alleles? We've mentioned it here in the second bullet, IA, IB, and small i. And that results in four blood groups. Now, if you know the one, two, three, four rule, one, you only have one blood group. You can't have blood group A and blood group B. You only have one blood group. Blood group is controlled by one gene. How many alleles are present in your blood group? Two alleles. How many different? Now, please note, you only have two alleles in your blood group. But how many different alleles control blood groups? Three alleles. And those are the three alleles. 
And what are the different blood groups that we get? There are four blood groups. Now, the inheritance of blood group display both co-dominance and complete dominance. And it is important to understand the difference. And I will go through the difference now. And please note the only notation, meaning how do we write um, the pattern for blood groups, IA or IB and small i. That's the only notation accepted. Right. So let's go through blood groups. How many blood groups do we have? We have four blood groups. We refer to your blood group as the phenotype. Okay, so you either blood group A or you are blood group B or you belong to blood group AB or blood group O. You can't have all four of them. You have one of the blood groups, but how many blood groups are there? Four. Um, what is the genotype for blood group A? Now, if a person is homozygous, do you all still remember the prefix homo, meaning the same. Both alleles are the same. Can you see I've got I, A, I, A. That is homozygous for blood group A. You have complete dominance, okay? If you are heterozygous, meaning you can I, A, small I from one of your parents, you still are blood group A, meaning I, A is dominant over the small I. So can you see how we can have complete dominance in blood groups? So if they ask you, write down the genotype of a person that is homozygous for blood group A, your answer is I, A, I, A, that one there. If they ask you, write down the genotype of a person that is heterozygous for blood group A, your answer is I, A, small i. If they give you this genotype and they say a person has genotype I, A, small i, what is their blood group? The blood group is blood group A. Is this an example of co-dominance or complete dominance? It is an example of complete dominance. Can I just ask everyone to please mute their mics? Thank you. Then we go to blood group B. Now, blood group B, the same. The person can be homozygous for blood group B. Then it's IBIB. Or they can be heterozygous for blood group B. Then it is IB small i. Where IB is completely dominant over small i. Now, here's an interesting example. A person can have blood group AB, meaning you get allele IA from your mother or father and blood group, sorry, allele IB, meaning the person is heterozygous. This person cannot be homozygous if you blood group AB. You can only be heterozygous. So none of these two alleles are dominant over the other, meaning we have co-dominance between IA and IB. That takes us back to our previous question where we said the inheritance of blood groups display both co-dominance in blood group AB and complete dominance. OK, where the capital A is dominant over small i. Blood group O, there's also just one genotype and that is small i, small i. Complete dominance. OK, I hope that is clear. Just remember, just to emphasize again, in blood groups, you have the one, two, three, four rule. What does the one stand for? There's one gene that controls blood groups, and you can only have one blood group. What does the two stand for? A person has two alleles for their blood group. What does the three stand for? You have 
three different alleles that controls blood groups. And what does the four stand for? You get four different blood groups. This can easily be asked as a question where they can ask you, how many genes control blood groups in humans? One gene. How many alleles, how many different alleles control blood groups? Three different alleles, okay? So please make sure you know that. Right, so let's have a practice question with blood group. I hope that was clear. So here we have a man with blood group AB and a woman with heterozygous for blood group B plan to have children. How many alleles, question one for one mark, how many alleles control the inheritance of blood groups? They're not saying in this example, they want you to, they ask you in general, how many alleles control the inheritance of blood groups? And remember the one, two, three, four rule of blood groups? So your answer is three alleles. Then they want to know, Describe the type of dominance that occurs in the inheritance of blood group B in the woman. Now, remember what we said here in the example? She is heterozygous for blood group B. So if she's heterozygous for blood group B, we should know what her genotype is, meaning a genotype is I, big B, with a small I. That is a blood group. So describe the type of dominance here. Now remember, some alleles are dominant and some are recessive. The capital I, A, I, B is dominant. The small I is recessive. So read the question carefully to see which blood group is mentioned. So you're going to say in this instance, it is what type of, they want to know what, describe the type of dominance. Remember, we said in blood groups can be complete dominance or co-dominance. So this is an example of complete dominance. One mark. Why? The allele for blood group B, that one, is dominant. And the allele for blood group OI is recessive. And that is why she is complete dominance. I hope that was clear. Just always remember, go back to the general, the one, two, three, four rule of blood groups. If you know that one, two, three, four rule, and you know the genotype for blood group A, for blood group B, for A, B, and O, you will not make a mistake with these questions. Right, let's have a look at this one. Use a genetic cross, remember our format for a genetic cross, to show all the possible genotypes. So you must show the genotypes and phenotypes of their children. Remember, we're still referring to the previous one. The question asks for the possible genotypes and phenotypes. So these will be compulsory marks. This means that out of the six if you do not give the genotypes and phenotypes, you can only get a maximum of four out of six. And remember our genetic cross recipe? We start off with P1. What is the phenotype of the male? And if we go back to the example, there we can see we said a man with blood group AB. So that is where we start. So it's blood. You don't have to write man blood group. So it's just blood group AB because that's his phenotype. It's crossed with a female, which is blood group B. Next, we need to write down the genotype. And very important, you can't just write blood group AB crosses with blood group B. You're not going to get your mark. Your mark is for this whole sentence. And this is why learners lose marks for genetic cross. So your P1, you first write down the phenotype. You determine the phenotype. What is the blood group of the male or the father? AB. Crosses, what's the blood group of the female? Blood group B. It doesn't matter which one you put first. 
Then for the genotype. So if it's AB, we said the only alleles, remember there are two alleles for your blood group. IAIB crosses with, because she is heterozygous, if you look at the previous example, they said she is heterozygous for blood group B, meaning she can only have IB with a small I, and that whole sentence is one mark. What does Mendel say? When we have alleles, meiosis forms, takes place, sorry, and we form gametes. And according to Mendel, when gametes are formed, they separate. So if these two separate for gametes, where well, one gamete in the male would be IA, the second gamete would be IB. On this side, your gamete would be IB with a small i. So you could either cross it like this, or you can go on this side, which I prefer, making a little punnet square. Everything on your left, you put there. Everything on your right, you write down there. And then IA with IB gives you that blood group. That one with that one, sorry, gives you IB, IB, IA, I, and there you have it. So there you get a mark, a second mark. For the gametes that are correct, you will get a third mark. Those are the genotypes. If they're correct, you will get a compulsory mark. For mentioning P1 and F1, you get a mark. For having meiosis and fertilization, you get a mark. And so what is your phenotype? So if that's your genotype, your phenotype, meaning which blood groups could be possible, that would be blood group AB. So now you're not going to write IA because that's genotype. We can have blood group AB, we can have blood group A, and we can have blood group B. Can you see there? Those two would give you blood group B. That would be AB, and that would be blood group. So three possible blood groups, or three blood groups are possible from a cross with a father being blood group AB and a mother being heterozygous. Now, this is a very easy one. Please work through it. Let's go to our next example. Apologies. The table shows the blood groups of the members of a family. So there I have father, mother, daughter, son one and son two. Two of their children, so that's the father, that's the mother. Two of their children are biological offspring of the parents and one child is adopted. Now, before you get an tackle an example such as this, try, so here's the blood group. So if the father's blood group A, his genotype, his possible genotypes could be IA, he could be homozygous for IA, or he could be heterozygous, IA, apologies for the handwriting, with a small i. Mother's AB, so she can only be IA, IB. Okay, the daughter is blood group A, meaning she got one from, if that's AB, meaning she got the A from a mother, and a small i from the father. So the father can, oh, there already we can see that's his po a possibility. The son is blood group O. Now for blood group O, you need a small i and a small i. Can the mother, could the mother have given him a small i? No, because she only has allele i a and i b. So this already we can eliminate, can't be the biological child. Son two, blood group B, he could get that from his mother and that allele from his father, meaning he can only be that. How many, let's have a look at the questions, how many different phenotypes for blood group appear in this family? Now the blood group, that's how many different we have one, A, two, we already have an A, three, and four. So there are four different phenotypes for this family. 
bloodgroup A, bloodgroup AB, bloodgroup O, and bloodgroup B. How many possible genotypes are there for bloodgroup AB? For AB, there's just one, IAIB, so it's only one. Give the genotype of the father. Now we've already determined. Remember at the beginning we said because his blood group A, he could be IA, IA, or he could be IA small i. The reason why we took this one is because of the son that could get, sorry, it's that because for them to be, they only need a IA. Okay, so there we can see 162, the genotype of the father can only be heterozygous for blood group. But which member of the family has the genotype small i, small i? And that is son one. Which member of the family has co-dominant alleles? We're not one of the alleles are dominant over the other. And we know from our previous information it is the mother which member of the family is adopted and we said it can only be son one and if they had to ask you a reason why he has blood group o meaning his genotype is small i small i so he had to receive one allele from the father and a small i from the mother which he could not have gotten from the mother because the mother has the genotype IAIB. Okay. I know it's a mouthful, but remember, always go back to your basics. And your basics are what is the rule? One, two, three, four rule for blood groups. Right. Now we're going to try this one on our own. So they say a man with blood group AB. So already you should know in the exam, if I was a matriculant, what is the genotype of this person? The genotype can only be, that's his genotype. And a woman who is heterozygous for blood group B. So what must her genotype be? If she's heterozygous, meaning her two alleles are different. Question one, how many alleles control the inheritance of blood groups? How many alleles? Three. Describe the type of dominance that occurs in the inheritance of blood group B in the woman. And the type of dominance here, it is complete dominance. Why? IB, the allele IB, is dominant over the recessive allele small i. And we've done this example already. Use a genetic cross to show all the possible genotypes and phenotypes of their children. Always remember, if you see genetic cross, even if you don't understand what's going on, what is our recipe? Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Apologies. It's you start off. Yes, with P1, you write down the phenotype. You go to the genotype. Meiosis, gametes are formed. Fertilization takes place and you get the F1 offspring. That already will get you two marks in your pocket. Right, and there we have it. We've determined the alleles. Three, complete dominance. And there we have a cross. So it's very easy if you have blood groups. Please, people, do not skip a question on blood groups. So they can either ask you, how many blood groups are possible in humans? Four. They could ask you a very higher order question. Explain how four blood groups are possible in humans. And then it's easy. You're going to say blood groups is, com is controlled by how many alleles? Three alleles. You're going to give the alleles I, A, I, B, small i, second mark. A combination of two alleles can give you four different blood groups, which is I, A, I, A, or I, A, I, B, or I, A, I, B, and small i. 
So you can see just by knowing the one, two, three, four rule and knowing your genotypes of the blood groups, you can score marks. So it's a guarantee if you look at your any question on blood groups, whether it's a multiple choice question, whether it's a genetic cross, whether it's just questions on alleles and the type of dominance. Remember, three alleles control the inheritance of blood groups and you get complete dominance. That, is, that would be complete an example of complete dominance. Or you can get co-dominance and that is an example of co-dominance. Are we okay with blood groups? Can we step off blood groups? Are we going to score marks on blood groups, grade 12s? Are we confident that they can ask us any question on blood groups? So I'm really going to challenge our teachers that when you set your June paper, your June test, that you will give them a question on blood groups. Otherwise, this session was null and void. I believe in you, grade 12s. You can do it. You know the one, two, three, four rule of blood groups. Right. Our second section for today is going to be on dihybrid crosses. Right. Now, if we break this up, what does di mean? Two. So now we can see a dihybrid cross involves the inheritance of two characteristics. Compared to two weeks back, where we spoke of mono hybrid cross, mono meaning one, we were only looking at one characteristic, like say the black fur of a cow compared to the white fur of a cow. We were only looking at the fur color. Here we are looking at two characteristics. Let's just take an example of a flower. We are looking at flowers that are with a stem as long or short, and we perhaps looking at flower color. So there are two characteristics. Now remember with the monohybrid cross, I told you for every characteristic, there are two alleles. So if you have two characteristics, how many alleles will we have? I'm waiting for an answer. You can just unmute and just give me the, the answer. Oh, you, oh. Ah, you guys are the best. You are the best, grade 12. We will have four. <laughs> Thank you. So Mendel then explained, and remember who Mendel was? Gregor Mendel is the father of genetics. Right, he explained the results of a dihybrid cross according to the law of independent assortment. If you remember back two weeks, we said Mendel had three laws the law of dominance, where if you have two homozygous individuals, the all the offspring in the first generation will have the dominant characteristic, but in the heterozygous state. We also had Mendel's law of segregation, where he said for every characteristic, we have two alleles, apologies, and the two alleles separate with, during meiosis when gametes are formed. So just to show you... Um, in monohybrid cross, let's say black fur, I'm just giving you an example. There's my, I have two alleles. And according to Mendel's law of segregation, these alleles separate during meiosis when gametes are formed. The third law of Mendel is the law of independent assortment. Now, please do not confuse this with the one in my osis, random arrangement of chromosomes, okay? Mendel's law of independent assortment, what does it say? The alleles of a gene, if you look here, the alleles of a gene for one characteristic segregate independently of the alleles of a gene for another characteristic. So remember, we are talking of two characteristics, and you guys were very smart. You said there will be four alleles. So let's just say, 
I'm just going to randomly. That's the alleles for fur color. And then the fur could either be long or the fur could be short. So I have four alleles for two characteristics. So he says these alleles will separate independently of the alleles of that characteristic, right? And they will come together randomly during gamete formation. It doesn't mean this one will go with that one. This can go with that. This can go with that. That can go with that. Or that one can fuse with that one. That means the two characteristics are transmitted to the offspring independently of one another. When we do an example, you'll be able to see that. So in a dihybrid cross, and I can tell you now already, they could ask you just from this information, what do we call a cross involving the inheritance of two characteristics? Then my answer is dihybrid cross. Or they could ask you, what is a dihybrid cross? And then you're simply going to write a cross involving the inheritance of two characteristics. Which law of Mendel applies to dihybrid crosses only? The law of independent assortment. Or they could ask you, write down Mendel's law of independent assortment. Then you're just going to say the alleles of a gene for one characteristic. Remember, segregate means separate. And very important here, they separate independently of the allele of a gene for another characteristic. Right. So let's continue. So the steps you should follow in working out a dihybrid cross. Now, I can guarantee you grade 12s, they will never ask you to, like with the monohybrid cross, use a genetic cross. They would either just give you the information as it is here in the stem, or they would give you the alleles as it is here, and they would either ask you, for the phenotype of a characteristic or the genotype of a characteristic or the genotype of the parent. So you should be able to just work it out. So step one. So here they say, in pea plants, right, now they can give you any example. Doesn't mean they have to give you an example. All they are testing is whether you understand that a dihybrid cross has two characteristics and it has four alleles for that characteristic. And whether you know whether the characteristics are homozygous or heterozygous. So in pea plants, the allele for tallness is capital T. So you already know, if I have a capital T in my genotype, plants will be tall. <laughs> Can we just pause? Thank you very much. And the allele for shortness, small t, is recessive. Right. So if a plant is homozygous tall, it can be homozygous tall, meaning the genotype will be big T, big T. Or the plant can be um, heterozygous tall, meaning big T, small t. So that's the possible genotypes for length of the plant. So the characteristic that we're looking up here is length, tall versus short. But then we're also looking at the flower color. Purple flowers is dominant and white flowers is recessive, meaning if I have a big P, big P, I can get purple flowers or I can get purple flowers from a big P, small P. Those are purple flowers. And the only time I'm going to get white flowers is a small P, small P. So if I ask you, if I give you this stem here and I say in pea plants, the allele for tallness is dominant over the allele for shortness. Purple flowers is dominant over white flowers. And I ask you, what type of cross is represented here? It is a dihybrid cross. Why? We are talking about the inheritance of two characteristics. And what are the two characteristics? The length, whether it is tall or short, 
and flower color, whether it has purple flowers or white flowers. So now they say two plants heterozygous for both tallness and purple flowers. So if I have two plants and I must give the genotype, they have heterozygous. Let's go to the tallness, meaning it can only be big T, small T. Purple flowers, meaning it can only be big P, small P. So that I know is my genotype. So if I have two plants, heterozygous for both tallness, across, meaning those two are cross. Big T, that, with big P, that. Right. Step one, identify the phenotypes of these two plants. So the one plant will be tall and purple. The second plant will be tall and purple. Both parents are tall and have purple flowers. Step two, choose the letters to represent the alleles. And they will never give you an example in an exam where you have to choose your own letters. Yeah, they provide you with the letters. So they say big T is tall, small T is short, big P is purple, and small P is white. Write down the genotypes of each parent. And there we've done the genotypes of each parent. According to the statement, both are heterozygous. Okay, so they're both heterozygous. Now, determine the possible gametes that each parent can produce. So if I look at, remember, according to Mendel's law of independent assortment, right, my gametes, they separate. So I have, and there you can see, there were two alleles for each gene. So I can have a big T, I can have a small T, I can have also have a big P and a small P and the same on the side. Big, right. And then you enter the possible gametes. But the only way in which we can do this is by means of an example. So I can have, if I just go back here, I can have those, that, and that one can give me a gamete. So there's my gametes. T, that, they have gametes of the one parent and the same gametes because the parents were the same. And then I just cross that big T. So remember with a dihybrid cross, with a monohybrid cross, you will just have T, T, big T, small T, big P, small P. But here in a dihybrid cross for every, you will have the two together. So you can get nine different genotypes. And there you can see the ratio already as nine, as to three, as to three, as to one. But this sounds complicated, but let's do an example. Remember, I said in an exam, they will really ask you to give a genetic cross for a dihybrid cross. Right, let's have a look at last year November paper. So now they say in human short fingers, if, so if you look at a person's hands, they have short fingers, is dominant compared to long fingers. So the one characteristic is short fingers and the other characteristic is long fingers. So if short fingers is dominant and it's F, then what would be the gene for long fingers? Small F. Widow speak, remember if you look at the hairline of a person here in front, Let's just say, oh, I'm very bad at drawing. Let's say that's the person's face and you look at the hairline. If the hairline is straight like that, there's no widow's peak. A person with a widow's peak has got that little, that is what we call a widow's peak for those that didn't know. So a widow's peak is dominant over a continuous hairline. So the hairline is just continuous. So that would be small h. Now they tell me a man and a woman, both heterozygous for the two characteristic. So the man has big h, sorry, big f, small f, 
the woman has big H, small H, and they give me the genotypes of the offspring. So there's the gametes. They give me the gametes and they give me the genotypes. But they left one of the genotypes out. Can you see there? Right. State the genotype at Z. So all we do to get that genotype, meaning that small f, small f, that one there, cross with that one. So I first put the f's together. So it's small f, small f. And then I have a capital H, and I always write the capital first and a small h. So there is my genotype. Give the genotype of the parents. Now I've got the gametes. So what is the genotype? So there you can see there's a big F. The heterozygous for the two characteristics, so being heterozygous, for that would be for the fingers, for the hairline, it would be that and that. So that would be the genotype of my parents. The number of genotypes that could result in offspring with short fingers and a continuous hairline. So if I look here, how many of these can give me short fingers? For short fingers, I need a big F, so that would be short fingers, and a continuous hairline? No, because that one would give me a widow's peak. This one would give me short fingers with a widow's peak because I've got a big H. To get a continuous hairline, I need two small H's. So now I know that won't give me, that won't give me. There's a possibility of a short, uh, sorry, of a continuous hairline, but will, keep, will it give me short fingers? Yeah, boy. Will this give me a continuous hairline? No. Will that give me a continuous hairline? Yes. Will it give me short fingers? Yes. So I already have two. That one won't. That one won't. That one won't. That one won't. Because remember, I need a small H. I've got another one there. That one won't because we've determined it. And that one won't because small f, small f will give me long fingers. So according to this, I can have one, two, three offspring with short fingers and a continuous hairline. Write down the allele. They only want the allele for the continuous hairline. And I see widow speak is big H is dominant over continuous hairline. So what is my allele for continuous hairline? It must be small h. Write down the phenotype, meaning the physical characteristics of a child who is homozygous recessive for both characteristics, meaning they must have small f, small f, and they must have small h, small h. And the phenotype of a child like that, small f, we've determined, would be long fingers with a continuous hairline. Right, let's have a look if we are correct. Let me just, sorry. And there we can see z, we've determined, it's correct there. That one, the genotype at Z, we've got the genotype at Z, the genotype of the parents we have correct. The number of genotypes is three, the allele is small h, and it would be long fingers and continuous hairline. And you won't get a mark for long fingers and one for continuous, you must give the correct Phenotype. So this is the type of questions you can expect from a dye hybrid cross. They will not ask you to actually do the cross, but they would give you the gametes or they would leave a gamete out. They would give you the genotypes, leave one out, and you need to know how to do it. Right. Here's a very nice example. There is variation in the characteristics. Now listen to this. We are talking about fur color and fur texture in cats. So there are two characteristics. A little light bulb should switch on. Let's see if we can do this. 
Yeah, woman, we got this, right? Okay. So the table below shows the alleles that control these two characteristics, fur color, fur texture. You see it's different letters. Yes, two, if you see two different letters, you know it's dihybrid. You know it's that big one, O-N-G. Thank you, ma'am, for the enthusiasm. Dominant phenotypes for fur Ooh. color. Let's quickly see, fur color, black. Who will be dominant? Black, black, right? Dominant phenotype for fur color, so black. Whichever school is my color. So small R, that's what they want. That's what they want, small R, right? Okay, but they're asking for the phenotype, so you're right, it's smooth, you're right. You must it just seems like smooth. someone else it's, over my It's the genotype of offspring A. What will this one's genotype be? Can I just ask the teacher from Balala to mute her mic, please? Thank you very much, ma'am. I really do enjoy your enthusiasm. And that's what I want from teachers. Are you with me? Because I might be going fast. And if your learners have a problem, stop the video and you can explain further to them. Like I've mentioned here, we are looking at two characteristics. We're looking at fur color and fur texture. So that should give you a clue. We are looking at a dye hybrid cross. Then they give you a table showing the alleles that control these characteristics. They're telling you fur is controlled. You can either have black fur or white fur. They give you the allele, so already you should know which fur color is dominant. Which fur color is dominant? Black is dominant. Why is black dominant? It's got a big B. If you look at fur texture, they give you the two alleles, and they say the fur texture could be rough or it could be smooth. Which fur texture is dominant? The rough fur texture. They give you a Punnett square showing the, uh, the inheritance of alleles in a cross, but they left that one out. Now they ask you, name the dominant phenotype for fur color. So if we go to fur color, they don't want the allele. They want the phenotype, the dominant one. And watch, which is the dominant one? Black. Why black? It's got a big B. The recessive phenotype for fur texture. So I need to go to this block. And which one has the small letter? So my answer is smooth. So it's black and smooth. Give the genotype of the offspring X. Now here, meaning I must have, I just need to cross that. And if I cross that, it is a small B and a small b, and a big r, and a big r. Of course, they're asking me for the genetic composition, the genotype. Give the phenotype of the female parent. There they tell you those are the male gametes. All the gametes from the female are that. So it can only be small b, the phenotype, so she has small b, small b, big r, big r. So a, a phenotype will be small b, small b. It would be white. White what? White fur. And big r, big r, rough fur texture. Right. State the phenotype of all the offspring. And if I look at all the offspring, so there we have a dominant phenotype, black. I hope we got it right, grade 12s. Recessive phenotype, smooth. Uh, the genotype of the offspring at X, we've determined small b, big R. There we can see the phenotype of the female. So you're first going to write down the genotype in your question paper and determine she has white fur with rough texture and remember it's two marks or nothing you're not going to get a, a mark for white fur and then we have in 153 we have the phenotype that all the offspring have in common which phenotype do they all have in common they all have rough texture in common right but this is only going to get along the same with blood groups. You're only going to get your dihybrid from practicing, practicing, practicing. 
So please do not be afraid of a dye hybrid cross. A dye hybrid cross can easily range from four to seven marks. Are you with me? You will not be asked to write down the format of a, of a dye hybrid cross. They will give you either the genotypes, they will give you the alleles, they'll give you the gametes, something will be missing and they will ask you short questions on that. So if you know your work, grade 12, it's easy to score marks. Do not be afraid. Do not be intimidated by the question. Do not be intimidated if you read and you think, but we have not done rough texture or anything like this in class. Right. Our third part of today's session is on pedigree diagrams. Now, what is a pedigree diagram? What does a pedigree diagram do? Now, please do not confuse. In grade 12, a pedigree diagram studies the inheritance of characteristics in a family over a number of generations. Okay? So they could easily, in question 1.2, a biological term, ask you, give the correct biological term for the study of inheritance of characteristics in a family over a number of generations. It is not a phylogenetic tree. It is a pedigree diagram. Then my answer is pedigree diagram. Okay? Remember, phylogenetic tree shows evolutionary, whether it has a common ancestor. Um, before I get to the steps when interpreting a pedigree diagram, you must look at the opening statement and look for dominant and recessive characteristics and phenotypes. Right, so let me first show you, this is what a pedigree diagram, a diagram such as this, it shows the inheritance of characteristics over gender. Rations. Now, usually they will supply you with a key at the bottom, but it is not a given. They can actually, one year they left the key out. So they actually expect a grade 12 learner to know the symbols of a pedigree diagram. Your squares always represent your males. Your circles in a pedigree diagram always represent the females. This horizontal line, sorry, if it is unshaded, it usually shows that they do not have the characteristic. If it is shaded, if it's a genetic disorder, it usually shows that they are affected by the characteristic. Okay, this horizontal line between the male and the female, that represents, sorry, Yes, the horizontal line shows that they have mated, they have reproduced. And in this case, that would be my first generation, that would be my second generation, and that would be my third generation. So they could ask you, if I give you a pedigree diagram such as this, I could set a question such as, how many generations are represented by this pedigree diagram? Then my answer is three generations. Okay. How many males are represented in this family? How many males? One, two, three, four, five. I did not ask how many males are affected. I said how many males? How many females? One, two, three, four. Five. Now, the key here says, if it's unshaded, the males have blue eyes. Unshaded, the female has blue eyes. If it is shaded, there are brown eyes and brown eye females. So I could set a question and ask, how many family members in this pedigree diagram has brown eyes? I didn't ask how many males or females, I asked how many family members has brown eyes. One, two, three, four, five have brown eyes. So you must be able to understand a pedigree diagram. They also tell me here, we are looking at the inheritance of eye color. Oh, yeah, in this example, they tell me there are three generations. They tell me that brown eye color is dominant over blue. 
Okay. Study the diagram and answer the questions. Remember I said squares represent male, circles represent females. That means they've mated. The line going down represents their offspring. So Joshua and Ronell had children. How many children did Joshua and Ronell have? They only had two children. What are the names of Joshua and Ronell's children? Sarah and Peter. I hope that's clear. Veronica, Peter then went on. Their son married Veronica. And how many children did they have? One, two, three, four, five kids, of which two girls and three boys. I hope we understand how a pedigree diagram works. Right. So let's continue. How many members of the family have blue eyes? Remember, they didn't ask in the first generation, how many members in the family have blue eyes? So blue eyes is unshaded. So it's one, two, three, four, five family members have blue eyes. And there we can see our answer. Is Veronica homozygous or heterozygous for eye color. So let's go back. Who is Veronica? Now, Veronica, if you look, she's a female and she has, according to the key, she has blue eyes. And blue eyes is the only way in which you can have blue eyes. The only genotype for blue eyes, a small b, small b. Because as soon as I have a big b, she will have brown eyes. So now they want to know, is Veronica homozygous or heterozygous for eye color? And according to that, the two alleles are the same. So what is Veronica? She is homozygous. Write down the genotype, meaning the genetic composition of Joshua, Ronell, and Frank. So I need to, Joshua, where's Ronell? Ronell and Frank. And what do they want? Do they want the genotype or the phenotype? They want the genotype. So Joshua, so now I know Ronell, sorry, has brown eyes. But Joshua has blue eyes. So the only way in which Joshua can get blue eyes is he had to have small b, small b. But if both their kids have brown eyes, meaning... One, that one allele had to come from the dad, meaning the only way they could get that is if she was heterozygous for that. So you could have big B, small b, the big B from the mum and the small b from the dad. So they got a big B, those two, from their mom. Only thing they could get from their dad is a small b. Same year. Big B from the mom and a small B from the dad. That we've determined. That's why I said you determine the genotypes. And there we have our answers. Does that make sense? So now they ask you, and that's two marks for determining the genotype because there are quite a number of steps involved. If Frank marries a woman with the same genetic composition as Sarah, now where's Frank? So Frank has, he's a male with brown eyes. Right. So if he marries a woman with the same genetic composition as Sarah, meaning big B, small B, big B, small B, they want to know what is the percentage probability of them having a child with brown eyes. And we know if two heterozygous individuals, so they both heterozygous, if two heterozygous individuals cross, the chance that the offspring will have brown eyes is 75%, because there will only be a 25%, one in four will give you small b, small b. I hope we're still okay. Right, let's look at an example from a question paper. 
Now, that's why I said, don't look and say deafness. We didn't do deafness in class. Miss didn't teach us or sir didn't teach us deafness. Read what is given. One type of deafness as humans is carried by a single allele. The diagram shows the inheritance of deafness in a family. So here they're giving you, look at your key. So now I know according to my key, those are males. If it's unshaded, they can hear. If it's shaded, they are deaf. So already I can write here, does is Paul, can Paul hear or is Paul deaf? Paul is deaf, okay? Mary is deaf. So how many individuals in this family is deaf? One, two, three, four, according to the key. How many, and here we go, we know that's Paul and Lizzie. That's the first generation. The second line shows my second generation. And my third line shows my third generation. So you fill in everything that is given. How many generations are represented in the pedigree diagram? That line, first generation, Paul, Lizzie, Mary, John. They had kids. Are you with me? Paul and Lizzie had three kids. Right, Mary and John had two kids, Bob and Anne got married, and they had three kids. So that's first generation, second generation, third generation. So, how many generations? Three. How many children of Paul and Lizzie are able to hear? So, that's Paul and Lizzie. Remember, their kids stopped there, they had three kids, and out of the three kids, how many kids? are able to hear and according to my key if it's unshaded they can hear so it means two right which phenotype is dominant if i look here there are more individuals that can hear so my dominant phenotype is hearing use the offspring of bob and Anne. so if i look at bob and Anne, bob could hear and could hear, right? But they had three kids, two could hear and one could not hear, right? To explain your answer, why hearing is dominant. And if we go there, we've determined that Bob and Anne can both hear. So we're going to start off with Bob and Anne can both hear. That's a mark. They have a child who is deaf. But, so you just interpret what you see. Right. They have a child that is deaf. It's another mark. So that child that is deaf had to get, because here at the bottom they're saying use the alleles big A for the dominant. So Or you could say they had the genotype small a, small a. But you could just say they have a child who is deaf. This means that each parent carries an allele for deafness. Meaning Bob had to have big A, small a, and had to have big A, small a, in order for this child to have a small a, small a. But it is masked by the dominant allele for hearing. And then they asked me in 244, use the letter big A to represent the dominant allele and the letter small a for the recessive allele to give all the possible genotypes for a hearing individual. So if hearing is dominant, they can be homozygous dominant, AA, or they can be heterozygous dominant, right? And that would be one mark, and that would be one mark. So first of all, with a pedigree diagram, grade 12s, make sure you understand the diagram. If I just go back to the pedigree, sorry. I just want to go back. Make sure you know your squares, your circles. Read what the disorder is. Read your key. Make sure you know who's related, who's children, because they could ask you anything about a pedigree diagram, and you should be able to answer it. Right. Our next one. So first of all, if you open your question paper and you see this, ding, light bulb should go on. This represents what type of diagram? A pedigree diagram. 
In humans, the ability to taste a certain stuff substance is inherited and is controlled by a dominant allele, big T. So if you can taste, you have big T. People who are able to taste the substance are called tasters. So if you're a taster, you have big T. So already I know for a taster, I can be homozygous for a taster, or I could be heterozygous for a taster. If I'm not, if I'm a non-taster, what must my genotype be? It can only be small t, small t. So just from that paragraph, this is the information that I've extracted. This person is a taster and that person is a non-taster. So now they say the pedigree diagram shows the inheritance of this trait. Trait just means this characteristic in a family. So this is my male. He's a taster. So now I already know he can either be big T, big T, or he can be big T, small T, right? This is my female. She is a non-taster. So the only thing I fill that in. So I fill in all my non-tasters, right? Because I can see. So that one can only be small t, small t. I fill in my, that can only be small t, small t. This can only be small t, small t. Because I know my tasters has two different types of genotype. Right, so if I look, that's my first generation, second generation. So somewhere here in my book, I would write one, two, three. Because I don't know if they're going to ask me that. So now. If this person is a taster, how many kids did they have? They had initially, they had one. That is not their child. That one got married there. So they had one, two, three, four children. Out of the four children, four are, not, are tasters and one is a non-taster. So to get the small t here, you got that one small t from his mother right? And the other small t had to come from the dad. So now I know already J must be a big T, small t, right? To get this, they can only get one small t from the mom. That can only be a small t from the mom. Because he's a taster, he can only be that, right? What does the term dominant allele mean? And that's a very easy question. There I must know my genetic concepts. Dominant characteristic or a dominant allele is the allele that is shown in the phenotype when it is in the heterozygous state. So it masks the recessive allele. Give the letter of a female in the first generation. So that's my first generation. Sorry, yes, my first who is a taster. Which one is a taster? So it can be a sheer taster. Sorry, that would be, that is my parents. That's my, my kids, the first generation of that parents a taster and they want a female that is a taster and my female here is in right does it make sense she's a taster that is a non-taster according to this use evidence from the diagram to support your question sorry a two for two i've missed the genotype of individual j so the genotype I've determined, where is it? Is big T, small t. And then evidence from the diagram to support. Sorry, it is cutting off here at the bottom. Let me just get my notes. Your answer to question 252B, why do I say J is a taster? So if I look at J, where is J? Is a taster and must have one dominant which is individual K. And there I can just, that is just understanding, interpreting my diagram for four marks. So please, grade 12s, once again, I'm going to appeal to you. I just want to go back. Please make sure you understand how to interpret a pedigree diagram. 
Right. Then we get our very last section. Now, this is just stuff that you need to study, right? Mutations. Now, please, if you look at textbooks, if you look at the answer series, there's a lot of information on mutations. What does your exam guideline say? What must you know for a mutation? You must just know what is the definition of a mutation. What are the effects of your mutations? Meaning mutations could either be harmful, they could be harmless, or they could be useful. You should know what are the types of mutation. You either get a gene mutation or you get a chromosome mutation. So you don't have to know point and frame shift and all that detail. So if we look at what is a mutation, you must know what a mutation is. It's a sudden change in the genetic composition of a organism, right? Either during any process, if something goes wrong, there's a change in the genetic composition. Now, not all mutations are harmful. Some are actually useful and some are harmless. So that's the effect of the mutation. What are the types of mutations that I get? I get a gene mutation. That is the change in the sequence of bases or nucleotides in DNA. When DNA replication takes place or transcription or translation and the, one of the bases change, that means I get a different amino acid, which could result in a different protein. That's an example of a gene mutation. Chromosome mutation is the change in the structure or the number of chromosomes. And the chromosomal mutation that we do in grade 12 at our level is Down syndrome, meaning on chromosome 21, instead of four, uh, two chromosomes, I have three chromosomes due to non-disjunction. So in my somatic cells, I will have 47. So it's a change in the chromosome number. So now I know Down syndrome. Is it an example of a gene mutation or a chromosome mutation? Chromosome. Which chromosome is affected? Chromosome 21, which has three chromosomes instead of two. So how many chromosomes do I have in my somatic cell, my body cell? 47. Right. So let's have a look at these four questions. I hope we can be able to answer them. A person... The first one refers to blood groups, and this is multiple choice. Remember when I did these subsections, I told you you can either have it as multiple choice, it can be in the section B question. A person has genotype IAI for blood type. Already, ding, light bulbs would switch on. What blood group will they belong to? What will be the phenotype of this blood group? Blood group A. What is this person's blood group? So now remember when you answer multiple choice, you keep the answers close first. So I know it's blood group A. So blood group A is there. So my correct answer is A. Okay. And please, once again, for multiple choice, even if you're unsure, do not say this was question 1.1.1. And you write A. But now some little devil here in the back of your head, you're not sure, is it A or is it C? So now you write A or C. Remember, even if A is correct, end of the year, we will mark this incorrect. Because in multiple choice 1.1, we only accept one answer. So afterwards, rather go back and do that. Delete that answer. Right, let's have a look at here. Which one of the following may result in Down syndrome in humans? Now, remember, just a few seconds back, I said Down syndrome. Is it a gene mutation or a chromosome mutation? So I know it's a chromosome. So already I know it's not A. There's D a G mutation. It can't be A. It can't be D. So yeah, failure of chromosome pair 21 to separate. Or failure of gonosomes. Gonosomes are my sex chromosomes X and A. It's got nothing to do with my sex chromosome, so it cannot be C. So my correct answer is B. And as a word of advice, grade 12s, multiple choice questions are two marks. And there's two marks for a reason. 
Sometimes the answer is obvious, like in 1.1, the first one here. But spend time. You have, remember in life science, 150 marks, 150 minutes. So for every mark, you have a minute. So you should at least spend two minutes per multiple choice question. So do not rush through it. My third one is on a die hybrid cross. I have long ears, dominant, over short ears. I have red fur, dominant, over black fur. That's the information given in my statement. Which one of the following could represent the genotypes of the parents? Right. An animal with long ears and red ear was crossed with an animal with short ears. So the parents for long ears could be that or that. That would give long ears and that would be, sorry, red fur. That short ears will give me short ears and that would give me black fur. So it cannot be that one. Does it make sense? Right. This parent, that would give me long ears, red fur, long ears, red fur. That is a possibility. Let's see. They say that an animal with long ears was crossed with an animal with short ears. So nowhere do I have short ears because that's long ears, long ears. I need another one with short ears. So that one is incorrect. That is short ears, short ears. Does it make sense? And they want to know which one is it? An animal, where am I? The genotypes of the parents, long ears. So it had to be a long ear and a short ear. And the only way I could get long ears and short ears is if I have parent number C. A child has blood group AB, her mother has blood group A. We can reasonably conclude that the mother's genotype is that. It could be that, right? The child's genotype is that. It, it can't be that one. Let's go to C. It could be that one. And a father's genotype is that. But because they've given us the mother's blood group, we already know that. So we can reasonably conclude that that should be my father's blood group.